All right, stand by. Here we go. You ready for this? It's a hell of a resume. She's a Canadian correspondent for Billboard magazine. She's won Music Journalist of the Year. She's had over 150 articles published in either Rolling Stone, Polestar, Melody Maker, Huffington Post. She's interviewed thousands of guests, including Kurt Cobain, Eminem, Shania Twain, Beyonce, Eddie Vedder, Robert Plant, Britney Spears, to name a few. She started the online mag, Samaritan Mag, as a way of giving back. It's a music-heavy site, but it's not just about musicians making a difference. It's about all kinds of good people trying to change bad things. My guest this week, the amazing Karen Bliss, one of my favorite journalists in the world. She made some time. My friends at Varia Brewing are giving you some stuff for listening and sharing and liking. We talk coffee as well. It's a really cool chat. You're going to learn something. Episode two of the Music Cast with the very awesome Karen Bliss starts now. Let's rock, let's rock today. Out on stage, I get to bring all of these people together for three hours. You're listening to the Brenton on Tour Music Cast, brought to you by people who love music, people who make music, and all things, well, music. You still don't really know who he is, but he just helped you stop drinking shitty coffee on the Coffee Cast. So, get off to John, grab a ghetto blaster, hit record and play at the same time, and learn a thing or two about music. It's the Brenton on Tour Music Cast. Here's BD. Hi, Karen Bliss. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm really, really great. Thanks for joining me on episode two of the Music Cast. It was uh, awesome that you made some time today. I really, really, really appreciate it. Looking forward to it. I am trying to use this series much like my coffee series as far as education goes. I was trying to bring people along a coffee journey that I had started only about a year and a half ago. Uh, I've been in the music business much longer, but uh, I still think that there's Lots of educating to be done. So I'm focusing this series on bringing some people into the mix that have been doing it a while, that have a lot of input into what's going on in the industry now, but also extremely well-respected in their trade. And to me, there are a few more respected than yourself. So thank you. I was going to say, uh-oh, you picked the wrong person. Uh, Well, I... uh, You were one of the first people I thought about for this because... um, I just, I love the work that you do and and you've been doing it, uh, some great work for a long time. And I thought you uh, could help the listeners understand and how you're navigating the world of journalism in its current form. So here you are, you're the Canadian correspondent for Billboard magazine. I am. You're the founder of Samaritan Mag. You've written, oh geez, I mean, the list is endless. It's Rolling Stone. It's Huffington Post. There's the, the list goes on and on national post i could just go on and read your bio and that would probably that would probably take up 15 or 20 minutes so i think what i want to do is i want to talk a little bit i want to start sort of at the beginning in the world of journalism for you when you started i i am curious when you you know what drives you to journalism what drove karen you know to journalism journalism? yeah what drove you to journalism music So it didn't really start as a passion for the news and for journalism. It started as a passion for music and me having zero talent in terms of singing or playing an instrument. So that's where it started. Huge music fan first, though. So it was like, it was like, hey, I want to start covering some of my bands. Or you just sort of dove in thinking that that was a great way to enter the music industry. Well, I was quite young and... I would go to all the local clubs in Toronto, sneak in underage just to see bands. I've never been a big drinker, so that wasn't, you know, the reason for going to these bars. And I would see local bands. I would then see the bigger concerts. I would see everything. I would uh, pick up Melody Maker and NME. Uh, I would get those either sent from my relatives in England, because that's where I was born, or I would buy them on the newsstands, and I was just insatiable for any kind of music um, content. I knew what Billboard was, and I would subscribe to Rolling Stone uh, and any music uh, publications, really. And I just wanted to do something in the music business. That's really where it started. Were you a credit checker on cassette tapes or albums or anything like that back in the day, sort of seeing who was covering the band, who was producing the band. I find that most people that are in the business 
have the same common theme that we all sort of studied you know, the albums from front yeah. to back. I loved know? liner notes. And to this day I do, although it's extremely frustrating because you do not get that type of information <laughs> from the record companies before an interview. I always have to ask like two, three, four, five times to get the liner notes because uh, I want to know who produced it, what studio, who co-wrote, who the special guests are. Even in the thank yous, there's little tidbits in there. So that information I have, and it's unfortunate now that I believe, you know, a lot of music fans don't get to see that information. It's interesting because I've got two kids and I've, you know, introduced them to, they're only 11 and nine, but I've introduced them to records. CDs, not as much just because most of the cars don't have them anymore. I, I mean, I have them all and I caught my daughter reading. She's a big Taylor Swift fan. I caught her re reading liner notes. And I was, you know, not, I don't mean in, in a bad way from catching. I just was like, she studied the record from front to back. And I'd asked her what, you know, what did you get from that? She's like, oh, she worked with this person. She worked with that person. What's a producer do? So she, it was cool. She started asking all those kind of questions and it is amazing how it opens up curiosity when you're in that sort of 10, 11, 12 year old zone. And then you're starting to try to figure out what you want to do and how you're loving music and bands now are just releasing everything. so digitally it's really like do you find that like you get excited when a band puts out an actual product <laughs> to yeah. go and actually read i mean i i love it when i go to a record store now and you got like a really decent album with liner notes and things like that do you, do you search for that now with some of your favorite bands what are you looking for yeah i always want to know you know who produced something and where and i want to read the lyrics and you know i'm big on music history when i go to a city whether it's where someone wrote a song or whether it's a, you know, independent record company or where someone used to live, a childhood home. I went to Omimi for um, Neil Young's special oh, yeah. concert that he did. And, no. you know, a guy there was like, oh, I'm going to walk you down to uh, where Neil Young grew up. And I love that kind of stuff. And it's not just me. I see it all over social media where people go to people's grave sites and childhood homes. And I think Bob Dylan many years ago went to uh, one of Neil Young's homes in uh, Winnipeg where Neil had grown up and uh, kind of the owners had come out and there's Bob Dylan, you know? <laughs> so I love that. Yeah. I heard about that old Mimi concert. I thought that was really great that he did that, you know, get bringing it to the small town. I wish bands would do that a little bit more often, actually. Yeah, it was amazing. You know? you where was that moment for you the aha moment for you like you go into it with a mission to cover music and be a journalist but was there a moment for you where you wrote that article that exploded and then or we wrote an article that just was positively received and you decided at that moment that this is this is it this is what i'm doing i mean i knew this is what i was going to do for my career. You just, you just went I, I for it right from the beginning. Yeah. I was a teenager. I didn't necessarily think I would be good at it. And I'm not necessarily sure I'm good at it now. It's just no one was going to tell me I couldn't do it. And back then, it was funny because people would think freelance meant free because the way I started, I was writing for local freebie publications or even for my school newspaper. So I wasn't getting paid. And it was all trial and error because I did not go to journalism school. So no one taught me how to interview. Uh, I would just kind of pay attention to how my editors would edit me. And I assume I got better and better. And because I was so insatiable for music and I knew about the industry, I, you know, I guess got better at doing interviews and I would listen to what the artist was telling me and that would give me information on how the industry worked. And I also um, got the opportunity after university to work for The Record, which was Canada's billboard. And David Farrell there was the publisher and he allowed me to write for them for many, many years until they um, folded. And I would learn about the industry through that, and also because I was out seeing bands, I got to know the a and people and the managers and the publishers too, and it was sort of, you would just share information, 
check out my new act or have you seen this act? And it was a really amazing community back then. So, you know, the, the record companies would tell me about new artists to check out before they were signed. And I would, you know, go to, there would be bidding wars, uh, Chris Taylor, an entertainment lawyer, very well respected. He would tell me about artists that he was shopping. Uh, I would tell a and people about uh, artists like the Tea Party, for instance. I was the one that gave um, their independent CD to the a and person uh, at EMI at the time. Amazing. So uh, it was a really, really fun time. And I learned a lot just from being around people in the industry and hearing all the musicians' uh, stories. Is it as supportive now or is it more com- is people keeping things a little bit closer to them now? Or do you find um, everyone's a journal trying to be a journalist now? <laughs> cough, cough. <laughs> Myself doing a podcast, right. but I'm trying to learn about things more on this thing. But are you finding it supportive? You now, talk about the su- actual music industry? Yeah, like the, as far as your role, like, you know, in journalism, as far as back then it was so supportive and everyone was was helping you and sharing information. Are you finding it's the same right now or um, you're a little bit more? Uh, uh, I would own? say, I mean, we're fortunate, I believe, in Canada. There are a lot of great people in this industry. And the fun part for me being in it as long as I have is watching people that I knew starting the same time I did, now rising to head up major labels or having very, very successful management companies or publishing companies. Like that's incredible to watch. Um, they're music fans. You have to be a music fan. It's, you know, it, it's, it's crazy hours, right? It's not a, a normal mm-hmm. uh, occupation to go into or industry to go into. Um, I find it more isolated now, which even though, you know, we've got social media to connect us all, I do find there's many people in the industry that I don't know. And maybe that's because I'm not young anymore. Um, So, you know, I'm not meeting them as much. Um, But back then I, quote, knew everyone, right? Um, I don't know a lot of the younger people in certain positions. Is it one of the, do you still, search for for bands now do, are you going to the clubs still every night like i know i don't know what the toronto scene is like now I've, i'm living in vancouver so i've been out of it for about 15 years but queen street was thriving for so long and i'm sure it still is are you still you know hitting the rivoli hitting the horseshoe and checking out bands and and i am stuff i mean or, maybe or? not as much as i used to um yeah. but yeah I, I love seeing up and coming artists uh you know it's the best thing about my job really Hmm must be fun to uh to catch them from you know the beginning and then sort of see the rise yeah of it it's happened a lot and it's yeah it's really incredible whether it's uh you know the weekend is one of them or you know from way back when nelly Furtado and some 41 and avril Mm -hmm. lavigne and uh just many acts that it's it's great to see good people achieve their dream. Right. And and there's nothing better than being in. I I actually feel it even when I don't know the person and have no connection. Like I had to cover Sean Mendes uh, headlining gig at Rogers center, which is a stadium. I mean, it was, it's massive, like 50,000 people. And to see this kid on stage pulling off this show in front of 50,000 people uh, and he's extremely talented. He plays, you know, guitar and piano and just very, very talented guy. It's incredible to watch that, you know. I feel proud even though I have, you know, no connection to him whatsoever other than we're both from Toronto. I think it's funny that I didn't, did the next day, didn't he go to Oshawa to get his driver's license? Did I hear that story? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I think he's pretty, had his I, driver's license for a while. There was something going on about that where he was in Oshawa doing something the next day. And I just think that's a, a great humbling Canadian story. It's like, well, hey, you know, I got to go get my license, eh? You know? right. <laughs> Let's hold on. So your, uh, your first, um, did you have a, that moment? Like, what was that first article for you where you were like, holy, like, it, what was the first major publication for you that picked you up? Did you have to write freelance first and then try to, I mean, try I've, to get, I've always try to get been freelance. Up? Yeah. Always been what was, oh, well, see, I mean, I don't write an article and then try and sell it. Um, 
I mean, freelance is just that I'm self-employed. So I always have been. Um, back then, I used to work for as many as 20 different publications because I'd write for a trade paper, a, a consumer music mag, uh, maybe a fashion mag, um, a, a movie magazine, and I'd do the, the music for those places. Now, of course, we don't have you know a lot of print publications, so it's online, and a lot of online don't pay very well. Mm -hmm. So I have noticed a lot of music journalists have had to drop out of the industry because they have families and they want to be responsible or they just can't, you know, pursue it. it it's tough, right? You got to, I, I make my living off ideas. Sure. That's what I tell young, you know, aspiring music journalists. You, you it's not about, oh, this person has an album. I'm going to go interview them. It's just knowing the industry and keeping your ears open and looking for stories and pitching and um, meeting deadlines and um, being accurate, knowing that of is not a verb. Um, <laughs> lots of stuff. <laughs> Are the fundamentals the same of journalism? But will they will they will they stay and remain the same? Obviously, people have to adjust how they're. And people adjust how they're getting their content now and all the rest of it. But the, the journalism student coming out of, you know, college or university or, you know, uh, yes, um, they haven't, are the fundamentals basically the same or are you trying to tell people to do it a little differently? No, now? Most definitely you know? it is. And there's, I've actually had some interns for Samaritan mag, which is my online magazine about giving back charities and causes and that kind of thing. And I'm actually shocked let's face it, how bad some of the um, journalism graduates and interns have been. Like, and I can tell immediately, I can read a story and they'll quote, like says Karen versus says bliss. And I'm like, who are, who's teaching these courses? Like, are they just breezing through? Um, they don't even know the fundamentals of writing a news story or how to interview. So I don't really get it. And, and it's probably, I'm not really probably talking about major universities with journalism programs. I would hope they're better, but some of the colleges here. Um, but, you know, journalism and music journalism are very different. I have friends who are hard news journalists uh, where there's actual consequences to what they write and why they write it. Uh, and there's an importance there. Um, you know, I do realize I'm only writing about music. I'm not changing any lives and uh you maybe what? could be a bit more lax with what you're writing than uh if you're really writing a piece about you know a crime or something else of importance was there an article that you wrote that you're i mean i'm sure there's been thousands but i guess you know album bands put out albums you know, there, there's athletes have great seasons. Is there a particular article that you are the most proud of? And I mean, and I'm going to get to Samaritan in a second to, to Samaritan Mag in a minute, that's because that's a, a great site that certainly you should be proud of. Right. Article, article wise, was there something that you're just like, I'm, man, I'm really. I'm really happy with this. This is, and look at what it's doing. Like, or, or you I mean, to tell awareness. you the truth, I'm kind of not that type of person. I'm, I'm British. Mm. So I'm kind of self-deprecating. Mm. Um, I have had other people write articles for me for Samaritan that yeah. went viral. And there was one, um, someone wrote about, uh, a group of people that would do designs on the heads of, women who had lost their hair t to a uh, chemo treatment or like, you know, alopecia. So they would do these beautiful, almost like henna designs on their head uh, and then photograph it. And that piece went viral. Um, you know, there are some incredible people doing incredible things, like making a difference in so many ways, whether it's, you know, knitting blankets for cats or whether it's, um, you know, going and, and raising money to build a school in a small village in Kenya, you know, like there's such a wide range of things that people are passionate about and where they find their thing in order to, you know, make a positive difference in the world. And 
you know, that makes me feel in my chosen occupation a little insignificant, uh, even though it's a super fun way to make a living and I would never change it. Um, so I am more inspired by those types of people. How did that, um, the Samaritan Mag come together? Because it's just loaded. It's just such a great site and so positive and where where did that idea come from for you and and what's uh, tell our listeners a little bit of, uh, about it right so really samaritanmag.com uh is an online magazine about people trying to make a difference and it's not a good news site it's a crappy news site because it's <laughs> i say it's good people trying to change bad things it covers a wide range cancer alzheimer's education women's rights animal rescue, you name it. Uh, I would like it to be bigger than TMZ. And I basically started it because I have a great job going to concerts for a living and interviewing creative people. And I guess it started with a this guy, Saul Guy, who was in the hip hop world. And he uh, had a record label position and he was managing uh, Rascals and uh, Chaos and Canaan. And, but he went with uh, War Child to Sierra Leone uh, with Rascals, I believe, and came back. Their lives were changed because they saw young kids with amputated limbs because of, you know, the conflict over blood diamonds and, met child soldiers and, you know, they would tell me these stories and I would want to write about it. And none of the publications I wrote for cared. Um, mm. Chantal Kreviazek and, and Rain Maida, her husband, they also uh, went with War Child to um, some war-torn countries. And again, like in some 41 uh, to yeah. the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I met the couple that started War Child Canada and they're, inspiring. And I just wanted to, to do something. And at the same time, um, Perez Hilton's site was exploding and he would be really nasty to a lot of, a lot of people really on his site, uh, particularly Avril Lavigne, who I knew when she was about 15, 16. So mm -hmm. it was upsetting to me that here's this young girl who's, you know, becoming enormously successful and he's, you know, saying all these nasty things about her. Um, yeah, and that the whole TMZ mentality of like catching people looking like crap at the grocery store and this person's got cellulite and this person's getting divorced. And it's like, who cares? Um, and I couldn't believe that grown people were actually enjoying sitting and slamming and being really nasty about other human beings. Like that's their job. And that's crazy to me. So that's why I started it basically. And well, that they've built a whole empire on TV uh, called reality TV <laughs> over, yeah. those, over those, uh, over that yeah. attitude. Well, it's I a mean, great, I don't want to um, sound like high and mighty or anything. Cause of course we all like make catty remarks and they're nasty. I'm not saying behind people's backs, but like to our group of, people will go like, oh, so-and-so gained weight or this kind of thing. But like to make that your, your living and to go on, you know, have a website dedicated to that and uh, have a TV show dedicated to that, like that's, that's crazy. Well, it's a pretty busy site you've got here, Samaritan. I mean, you've got tons of articles on it. Is there anything that you would tell people to you know, well, I think you could just spend, you can spend hours on this site. Right. Well, it's, it's very so music heavy for obvious yeah. reasons. You know, I've got interviews with Ed Sheeran and Metallica and uh, Avril Lavigne and Shania Twain and um, Slash and on and on. But we also interview, you know, people that aren't well known about the causes that they're supporting or initiatives that they've taken you know we'll cover the businesses we'll cover like products where you know some of the proceeds go to a charity um animal rescue is more popular than most of our articles on musicians we've done pieces on donkey rescue parrot rescues pig rescues like there's so many oh there's a rat rescue um rat you said rat yeah rat <laughs> there is someone who is passionate about 
rescuing rats. Um, so yeah, it's been really fun. How many people contribute to the site? It looks like there's quite a lot of, uh, it's quite busy. So well, I'm guessing. My fellow music journalists, we have uh, Nick Cruin, Kim Hughes, Aaron Brophy, all well-established longtime music journalists. They've been amazing. I do pay my writers. I would like right. to pay them more. So if anyone's out there and wants to be mm-hmm. a benefactor, sponsor the site, advertise on the site, I would welcome it because, you know, I basically run it by myself in between doing my music journalism for Billboard, and it would just be great to uh, make it bigger than it is. Well, kudos to you for putting this together because it's a load of work, and I, uh, I'm i trying to <laughs> put out a podcast a week and write about it and do some stuff, and and I'm just you know adding that to my life as far as everything else that's going on and touring and trying to you know run concerts and all this other stuff. So kudos to you to pull this off because um it's a lot of work and i'm i'm feeling it just putting trying to put out a weekly podcast well (laughs) if you have good writers it's less work that's what i've discovered through trying to get interns where i have to rewrite stuff and flip them upside down and fact check if you have good established writers there's much less editing and fact checking to do so it's definitely worth doing that so karen you've written for billboard rolling stone uh, loads and loads and loads of publications. Is there any interview in particular that you're, is your favorite or who are some of the artists that you've interviewed over the years? Uh, I mean, it's kind of cool to look back because I interviewed Jimmy Page and Eminem, who I would love to interview again, and Britney Spears. I believe I was the first person in Canada to interview her. Uh, Kurt Cobain, which might be dating myself. Um, Else. And uh, my, I get, you know, I don't really have a favorite, but I interviewed Eddie Vedder when I was starting out. I knew Pearl Jam's 10, like the back of my hand. I freaking loved that album. I still love that album. And I so enjoyed talking to him. It was over the phone. And I don't even think the album, it, it either had just come out or was coming out. And it was just, it was hilarious. You, it, it's actually been reprinted on Billboard for, uh, it was like an anniversary. It might have been for the Hall of Fame induction. So I dug up the cassette tape and transcribed it mm. and Billboard reran the story. And it's funny because uh, at the end of the interview, he said, if you need anything else, just call me back. And I've never interviewed him again. And they just became huge. He doesn't do a lot of interviews. I had no connection. And all these years later, I would love to sit down with Eddie Vedder again. And especially because of Samaritan Mag and, you know, the all the charity work that he does. Um, and it's just never, ever happened. Um, well, but- they only put a record out every, you know, five years and he's doing his solo thing. Um, it's, you know, I mean, I'm sure he'd love to revisit that time with you. And is there a better one, two record than that in versus, you know, it was funny because he was talking at the time we were talking about, he was a surfer and how he preserves his voice. And then we got talking about tattoos and he was saying that he doesn't like tattoos, but then he's like, but don't, don't print that. Cause I guess his, um, uh, best buddy, uh, Anthony Kudos from, uh, chili peppers had tattoos. (laughs) So I think I wrote the story back then. Oh, I think I wrote the story and didn't actually um, use that piece until, you know, recently. I'm like, well, I'm sure he doesn't care now. I'm sure he's got a few tattoos of his own now. That was him just calling you. Uh, Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. (laughs) Eddie. Giving you shit about talking about Anthony. It's been so long. How many Pearl Jam shows have you been to? A lot. Not as many as I have uh, Springsteen or Mm. my soft spot for Brian Adams. That's a whole other story. You know, yeah. well, we have, we have time. You can tell that story. You know, that's, that's an artist. I've actually, I've actually never seen Brian Adams. If you can believe it. I've okay, in all the years. That all is the crazy. You should get your citizenship revoked. Well, how he, can you not he, have seen him in your he in moved, hey, business? He moved to England. So yeah, maybe he, he, tours, yeah. he tours constantly, constantly, constantly. I actually just haven't seen now he's calling to give me shit. So there you go. I haven't actually, 
uh, he, he hasn't toured a lot over here. He did that big run through Canada, I think, last year or the year before. And I was actually following him around the world this year, but never lined up to actually see him. And I was intending to see him down in Australia when I was there and I missed him. And there was a whole thing. I've just followed him and have never had a chance to actually go see a Brian Adams show. So that's very interesting. Well, but- it's really fun because you know every song. So... You know, and it's interesting because I met, you know, Pat Stewart, who was his drummer on all that stuff back in the day. And he's a great guy. And and I know tons of people that work with him. I just never had a chance to go. Uh, but on the Pearl Jam side, I've, ton of, I've done a ton. Um, Springsteen, I've seen a couple of times. But I mean, is there a favorite concert of yours? If you can lay it out, is there a favorite that's like undeniable, your number one concert you've ever I been mean, to? I mean, undoubtedly Springsteen. But we haven't talked about this, but Keith Richards is my ultimate favorite artist of all time, someone I have not interviewed. I interviewed him for a couple of minutes on a red carpet during TIFF a couple of years ago. Um, Stones, I absolutely love. My childhood bedroom was like covered in in Stones uh, posters and little pictures and stuff. Uh, Springsteen, close second, but he's definitely my favorite artist live. Was there a Um, show in particular for you where you're like, that's the show? Because you remember, I, I remember, yeah, like, was there like, oh, man, Toronto was great, or I was in New York and I saw him, or, you know, I was in I mean, London and I saw him. he's fantastic all the time. He really, really is. You know, and I My, saw um, Keith Richards in Detroit and at Massey Hall here. Um, but the, the I mentioned Brian Adams, um, and I should mention Corey Hart, because those are two artists that kind of had... Uh, an impact on my music journalism career. Um, Corey Hart, because I was very young and I saw his uh, sunglasses at night video. And I naively called up the Toronto Star editor, like entertainment editor, and complained that there was no review of his Al Combo show. Uh-huh. And he said, oh, write a letter to the editor. So I wrote something, which they never printed, but I used that to get my first writing gig. Um, Amazing. And... Brian Adams, you asked me about liner notes. And I remember my uh, best friend, Lisa, at the time, um, had gone to see Foreigner in Montreal and came back and was like, we got to go to Buffalo. This guy like Brian Adams is uh, opening. I just saw him like open for Foreigner. And uh, so we like drove to um, Buffalo, bought tickets like from scalpers. He was opening for Journey. Uh, just went right up to the front, rocked out for Brian, and then went to the side of the stage. And I had looked on one of Brian's albums, like with the liner notes. So we were like, uh, yeah, can you tell Keith Scott, uh, Karen and Lisa here? And Keith was, you know, he's he's been Brian's guitarist all these years, like 30, maybe 40 years. I can't even remember. And um, anyway, and Keith came up because, of course, he didn't know who the hell we were. And been friends with him ever since. And that was before I was a music journalist. But, uh, you know, I never miss a Brian show. He doesn't really like doing interviews. Um, so I don't really hassle him for that. I do periodically interview him. And he is a tough interview, that's for sure. Um, but always fun to see his shows and um, always fun to hang with Keith. And Corey Hart's become a good friend, too, which is funny. And he just did that big tour across Canada again. I actually, one of the first, um, well, not first, but I definitely had Sunglasses at Night on 45. And then he made the red album. He made the album in red. Um, he did um, everything in my, and then I think he did like a Christmas release of everything in my heart or something like that. And it had like a red thing. And I had a cousin that worked in radio at the time and brought it to me. And it was like the coolest like record. And, you know, Corey was, was pretty rocking back then. So, uh, him and Billy Idol and all this, all, all the time, they're all putting out this great, all these great, you know, picture discs and records. And it was really, really cool. So it was uh, a lot of fun to be a uh, part of that. And when we still had record players. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have them again. <laughs> I've got one again. I've got a 78 or a 68 Forza upstairs, which is awesome. So right. that's an old uh, RCA one. So that's pretty great. Uh, did you see the Stones this week, uh, this summer then? They were in Toronto, right? They were north. Of course I did. Yeah, how was that? I heard it was a great show. Um, yeah, I mean, it was up at Burles, Burles Creek. Um, I don't even know how many people, tens of thousands of people. You have to be in the right frame of mind to see a show that size. 
because I've seen them in small places and big places. And you just have to just go in knowing you're just there for the experience that, you know, Mick's going to be the size of your thumb. Um, but it's pretty incredible. They're all in their seventies. Like, honestly, I'm tired after, you know, 45 minutes and Mick's running around and even to have Charlie behind the kit for that long and Keith, like, you know, it's amazing. They didn't, didn't they do, um, the warehouse in Toronto, well, it was the warehouse in Toronto. I don't know what they changed the name of it to. I can't remember. Um, but then they play the warehouse and then Danko yeah. opened, Danko opened for them. I wasn't at that, at show, that show, unfortunately. Yeah, was- I think I was away, but I did see them at the Palais Royale and at the, uh, Phoenix. And it's always incredible to see a band like that in such a small place. It's much a small club. Yeah. Awesome. What's next for Karen Bliss? What do you got going on coming up here in the next little while? I want to send people to set up Samaritan Mag is where everyone can find you, SamaritanMag.com. Uh, where else can everybody find you online uh, on, uh, top of bill, on top of Billboard? Oh, well, tons of stuff for Billboard. Uh, sometimes I write for Variety as well. My former editors from Billboard went over to Variety to you know head up their music division. Uh, sometimes write for the SoCan publication. I have uh, some other tidbits I'm hoping to get off the ground, including a documentary and an app that I cannot reveal what they're about. <laughs> and hopefully I'll successfully be able to pull those off. We'll see. Uh, you always need help. That's how yeah. it works, as you know. Yes. It's but are we going to talk about coffee? Yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, do you have a coffee? I actually just finished it. Yeah, well, I was Should I bring to- out another one? You should probably always have a fresh one <laughs> yeah. to keep yourself caffeinated. As I've learned in our preliminary chats, you are also a coffee addict. I don't know if I'm an addict, but I do love a coffee. I love a you, really, really good coffee. Anything Which, in particular in Toronto that you love? Uh, my neighborhood spot, Sam James, is fantastic. And uh, my Nespresso coffee maker in my kitchen is also fantastic. You kind of blast through all those different, like, you know, you go espresso, you do, do you ever dare do the decaf or you kind of have one particular brand of an espresso that you Funny like you should say to. that because I don't believe that coffee affects me in any way and I don't sleep a lot. So I don't really care if it does affect me and keep me up. So I will have a coffee at 11 at night or midnight, <laughs> but I've recently tried the decaffeinated coffee from Nespresso and it's really good. You cannot tell the difference. There's um, there's a place in Australia called Death Before Decaf. Right. <laughs> so that's a really good place, but they they amazingly make an incredible decaf. So I don't know. It's a really cool cool thing that I've added to my world because I actually enjoy the, the taste of it. So it's uh, it's a fun journey to be on. So and we're gonna send you some coffee products, but I'll get to to that. Excellent. The coffee journey, you know, we did the, the coffee podcast. I did like 10 episodes and I wish uh, I could have had your take on that, but um, you know, we'll move on from that. So you've got, what are you working with? You got an espresso at home. What you've got, is there sort French of like a press? You've got a French press and I've but got a what new. Happens, the issue with the French press is I always make too much. You so do. If I just want, you know, a good solid cup of coffee and not have like, a half a cup left over. Um, I got to use the Nespresso. So that's my issue with the, with the French press. What do you over caffeinate yourself? Is that what's happening? You mean if I have more, <laughs> I like yeah. to have one great cup of coffee. Cause one great, that's it. I one mean, great. I could have, I could have more, but I tend to drink more coffee when it's crappy coffee. Like if you're in a breakfast place and they keep refilling it, I'll just say yes, yes, but I'm not enjoying it. You know, so, well, you're just drinking. And when I have like a really good cup of coffee, I enjoy every sip. It's like chocolate. And then I don't need any more. But if they're just filling up the cup with like crappy coffee and then, you know, my, my pet peeve would be when you have the sugar and the milk just right. And then they come and they fill it up and you're like, oh. Now I gotta freaking do that, you know? Well, you gotta start drinking black coffee then. I can't. You know, I, no? I can if it's really good. 
If it's well, there you go. Yeah. You gotta, we got to find you a good one. I mean, you've got a couple. I mean, Toronto must be loaded with it. Where else did I go in Toronto? Balzac, I think. Yeah, Balzac. They're, they're pretty great. And then I'm yeah. sure. I mean, I don't know the scene there right now, but I just went to um, a coffee festival in Vancouver this weekend called Beanstalk. And I think they're coming to Toronto in May. So that's something you might want to think about. It was, it was a, it Even was, if it I mean, coincides with Canadian Music Week, which is also about, in May, I'll have to pick. Uh oh. <laughs> well, you know, I think that you could, you would benefit from, uh, from going to check it out, especially, you know, as yeah. great of a, a, as you, you like to drink it and you like to discover yeah. it. So I like the Greek great... coffee, the Vietnamese coffee. Really? That's interesting. What, and the cold brew. You're digging the cold brew. Yeah. I sometimes like cold brew. I don't necessarily like the ones that have been packaged as cold brew. I've mm. tried them. Um, I'm going to try my own. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you, we got a new sponsor on here um, called Vry Brewing. And they've got like a six in one that does filter French press. It does mocha. It does cold brew. You name it. It does it all. So I'm going to send you one of those and the lever presso for coming on as well. Cause I still got a couple of those kicking around from Excellent. the coffee, from the coffee cast. Am I and, allowed um, to ask you what you think of uh, Tim Horton's coffee? Yeah. Well, the first article uh, I wrote from a blog standpoint was um, which coffee asshole are you? Where I asked people, you know, which coffee asshole. And one of them was the people that don't change from drinking Tim Hortons and Starbucks and refuse to, you know, move into coffee culture, which is actually getting out of your car and walking into a place and letting them make you a coffee that might take seven minutes instead of 30 seconds, but the experience would be much better. Tim Hortons However, for me- However, you can't put Tim Hortons and Starbucks in the same sentence. Their coffee is not, not even their Tim Hortons dark roast, quote, dark roast is- you know, it doesn't even come close to Starbucks, like Pike no. Place. Like Starbucks it, as a franchise has great coffee. Well, it's how they, ro it's, it's all like about nasty. roasting for me. It's all about right. roasting for me. I have, I don't, uh, I do not frequent Tim Hortons at all. So it's one of those things where I'm even, I even get annoyed with the feel good Tim Hortons commercials where apparently if you have a Tim Hortons in your hand, you can solve all the world's problems. You could probably see them on a weekend uh, hockey broadcast where it's like, oh, you know, we can't get the kid motivated to do anything. But dad's got Tim Hortons in his hands and life's going to change now. Yeah, I don't I'm not a big fan of the Tim Hortons feel good commercials. I was in Glasgow, Scotland. They have a Tim Hortons downtown. I'm like, let me give it the old Canadian try and just get an Americano. And it was awful. And I'm like, yep. They what about McDonald's coffee? That's pretty well, good. This is an interesting thing. So Tim Hortons changed their bean. Right. I, I heard Mac that story. And McDonald's swept in and grabbed it. Right. So I think the McDonald's coffee that you're, that people are getting now is the old bean from Tim Hortons, which is why they took over the coffee business in Canada from that sort of standpoint. And I think there's a real competition between the two. I don't have a problem um, with the McDonald's coffee, the interesting part is I'm only like a year and a half into my journey, Karen. So I actually didn't do the Tim Hortons McDonald's drive through things leading into this. I went right to Italy <laughs> and, I, and I went right to all the, you know, Colombia and Brazil and got all this great stuff from all well, over the place. You saved like all that money from like buying all yeah. that coffee. Like I've been drinking coffee since before, <laughs> before I discovered music probably. So so I, I never got the, I never did the Tim Hortons, you know, McDonald's thing where I would go spend all that money on that. So now I, I just try to find, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do McDonald's. I'll do Starbucks. I don't not do things. I just prefer to go and search for amazing yeah. coffee. Oh, I, everywhere. Get it. I mean, so, it's just, it is a shame. It's like, it'll set you back five bucks a cup. It really annoys me because that actually um, impacts my buying decision. Cause if I, I, I might want, you know, a latte, but I'm like, mm. I really don't want to spend five bucks on a cup of coffee. It annoys but that's me. where they make all their money because that's, yeah. you know, and that's, that's the thing. So, um, <laughs> I guess you're going to have to 
if you're going to have to find that spot local to you that charges you only yeah. $3 for a latte. Yeah, they don't really. Well, there's a couple of like little local Portuguese and Italian places with half decent. But right. I can come home and for 70 cents have my Nespresso. But that, you know, and this espresso is getting expensive enough as well. So, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, the, the challenge is, is real as far as where, and I think that's where the, where the issue is, is that where Tim Hortons, Starbucks, McDonald's gets you through the drive through and gets you in and out fast and they can still do it under two bucks or whatever is really just, it's such a way of life over here in North America, whereas around the world, I find that, you know. Well, you can't drive in a lot of those towns anyways, <laughs> downtown, right. you know, you can't, you got to get out and you got to go in. So you got to get, you got to have to pay for that service. So, yeah, I mean, I don't mind them. I, I, I drink them all right now. I'm trying to discover the best coffee in the world. So, you know, and what is it so far? Uh, the, so far, my favorite is from Tim Wendelbow in Oslo, Norway. And he was on episode 10 of the coffee cast. He was my final episode of the coffee cast and he ships it all over the world. So you can actually order it. It's amazing. And he, uh, he spends three months on, um, he spends three months on a, on a farm that he owns in, in, um, South America right. and to really, you know, and he's very, very conscious of how much he pays the farmers and it's. So what would a pound of his coffee ship to Canada set you back? Um, pound wise, I'm not sure you can order by the bag and you can do like a monthly subscription. So from what I gather, I think you could do like 15 to 20 bucks a bag, you know, of coffee. And it's pretty reasonable if, cause the coffee subscription service thing is new to a lot of people as well, but it, that very much exists, um, around where people get it shipped from all over the place. And he offers that service. I, I found it in Cleveland. I think you can find it in Toronto. I don't know the specific spot, but somebody texted me the other day and said that they had a Tim Wendelbow from Toronto. So I'll try to track that down and send it. And my send last it to you. question, since I'm turning the tables on you, that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> Have you tried the coffee? I'm not exactly sure on the process, and I'm sure you know what I'm about to ask you. Where there's some creature that digests yeah. the bean and. Okay. Yes, shits it out. So, yes. Yeah, so this is actually, rel no, I haven't. And it's extremely controversial now. And not that I'm getting preachy on a, you know, I'm not standing up and, and getting preachy per se. But what happened is, is it was a very unique coffee that only a handful of people in the world knew about until Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson made that movie, whatever that movie was, the um, uh, Bucket List. And he talked about this unique coffee from around the world. And now everyone wants to try it. And the, pro the problem is, is that what's happening is, is because it's become so popular, what made it so unique is that you used to have to send people into the jungle to find the stool of these lemurs and these different, you know, animals that were, you know, shitting it out. And then that the process was finding it. Well, now they're force feeding the animals to uh. make it and mess quantities because it's so popular that you'll go into these, you know, wherever that is. I think it's Indonesia and some of these other places where they're force feeding the animals in cages. So this is what I've learned right. on this I because mean, people, I people think ask it me would about be it. Popular. I it's, personally, as much as I love coffee, would not try that. I would, however, like my own pet lemur. <laughs> it's, well, they're pretty rad little animals. I wouldn't force feed them coffee beans, but they're apparently all addicted to them now. So that's what the problem is with that. Right. And there's always going to be some asshole that wants to be on it. They're like, they're like, hey, you know, I only have this coffee bean at my house. You know what I mean? Hey, you know, this is the lemur stuff. It's like, <laughs> right. I, you know what I mean? It's like, but I, I, I haven't tried it. I don't intend on trying it strictly for the fact that um, I feel like from what I've been told also, it tastes like ass. No pun intended. Right. It's just, it's, it's awful. Sense. It's awful. So I, it won't be on my list, but uh, not, neither is Tim Hortons. So that won't be on my list either. So I'll just uh, keep searching for the best copy I can find and I'll keep searching, you know, all over the world for it. And I'll keep sending you my recommendations and hopefully you can, right. you can uh, have some, you know, for yourself and get it shipped in. And I'm sure. going to send you some products for coming right. on the pod podcast. Feel I really free to put some beans in there. Well, like I'm a little handful of like, whatever your choice beans, your favorite from Norway. Well, I'm so headed over there little, in a little baggie. I'm headed over there in a month. So I'll, uh, 
I'll try to ship some back over uh, for coming on the on the podcast because this was really nice of you to do that. And I know you're busy and you're writing lots of stuff and and uh, you're making time for little old me to help launch this thing all Thank around the world. It. And it's really great. Karen, I'm a huge fan of your work. Uh, congratulations on everything that um, that you've done and what you're on, uh, what Thank you're doing. You. Uh, congrats on Samaritan Mag. I really am a huge fan of uh, what you're doing there. And anywhere else you want to send people here before I let you go? Uh, no, just there. Spread right. the word about Samaritan. And if you uh, are listening and you have uh, your own charity or a cause that's important to you, or you've set up a lemonade stand and you're giving the money to, you know, your neighbor to, because they just had a fire, like whatever it is, big, small, just message me. Do just that. And drink great right. coffee. <laughs> yes. Awesome, right. Karen. Thanks Thank for your you. time. And uh, we'll talk soon. You can get more music talk with me, Todd Hancock, and the Toddcast podcast. We release a new episode on Tuesday. Yesterday's podcast, November 12th, is all about legalized marijuana a year later in Canada. Twelve guests share their thoughts, including Danko Jones, Devin Townsend, John Karabi from the Dead Daisies, and you gotta love Slash Bass's Todd Kearns' thoughts. You know, it's so funny because now that everything's legal, I'm the most boring guy you know. Um, sober for a long time and all that. And, uh, but I've always been sort of the mindset of like, dude, why is it not legal? Todd Kearns talking about legalized marijuana. Hold it in. <coughs> the Brenton on Tour Music Cast is brought to you by the Toddcast Podcast. Follow us at Toddcast Podcast, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can hear the podcast, full interviews, and lots more through toddhancock.ca. Don't be a stranger. We'll see you soon.